couple of weeks from last time when we met. I think we yep. you have been doing a lot of tinkering with some of the solution accelerators. Yeah, I'm, I'm well really... under the hood of the solution accelerators, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to see. I think uh, we briefly discussed about it and we uh, I got a little bit of glimpse of what, what you have planned for today. So yep. I think it's going to be really exciting. So yep. uh, for our viewers, welcome everyone. And I'm really excited to be here with my friend, Andy. And we are going to talk about solution accelerators. So this is, I just, uh, before we jump into our uh, detailed discussion for today's topic, I just wanted to briefly uh, go over to our YouTube channel. And I also wanted to point us back to the, to the first episode that we did a couple of weeks back on solution accelerators. Uh, this was kind of an introduction uh, about what solution accelerators are, how, what purpose they have, and how it's can help us build a robust solution, which is a reusable and also uh, built on best practices, right? So that that will really help uh, for everyone, whether they are starting out their automation journey or they are seasoned professionals alike. Uh, I'm uh, like I mentioned last time. Also, I'm really uh, excited and and I'm really impressed with kind of documentation and details that they have provided out there. So Andy, I won't take much time. Uh, so with that being said, uh, take it away, my friend. Hi, thanks, Pradeep. And I am sharing my screen and you must be seeing the orchestrator manager component in the marketplace. I won't be going into the detail of how to get this component down and open it in studio. That's because we have um, you know, made a series on UiPath Marketplace. So I do expect my audience to either watch those series or, uh, you know, you must be already having the fundamental knowledge of how to acquire a component and then have it open in studio. And besides, you can always directly open a component from UiPath Studio uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the option provided uh, in studio itself. So assuming that you have uh, downloaded this component and you have opened it in um, in Orchestrator uh, in, in UiPath Studio. I'm going to switch over to the project and uh, let's take a quick uh, view of how that Orchestrator Manager project uh, looks like. So I'm in Studio and um, I have opened the main page of the Orchestrator Manager project. Uh, the first thing you have to understand is this is designed to run as an attended automation. That is because this automation uh, expects your input and expects your interaction before it can do something. And uh, you will have to identify uh, the orchestrator tenant to connect to. And therefore, without those inputs, this the orchestrator manager will not work. And if you look at the browser uh, of, uh, you know, go into the project explorer and um, try to get information on how this project works, I would say, I would recommend that that is not the best thing to do because the project is pretty detailed. It has got a lot of moving parts. And my suggestion would be that you try to learn how to use Orchestrator Manager as an end user. And then once you have figured out how that works, you can work your way back to the various areas of, of this project so that you know your entire learning process is complete. But you should be able to run Orchestrator Manager without knowing a lot about the internal moving parts, right? So try to focus on, on using this as an end user and trying to achieve the goals of your uh, RPA uh, Center of Excellence. And if you are a lead dev or if you are a technical manager or a solutions architect, uh, you would be using this to move or kind of uh, migrate uh, a lot of Orchestrator entities from a source orchestrator to a target orchestrator. For example, you might be having a lot of uh, queues, you may have many assets, and you may have uh, many credentials. And uh, those are the kind of things that you want to kind of move from source or, uh, or migrate from or deploy from source orchestrator to target orchestrator. Therefore, uh, our focus here will be mostly on how to uh, use this component 
And also we will show you some of the, uh, uh, you know, we will also present a case where we think that the orchestrator manager must be used in a sophisticated manner uh, because we are talking about orchestrator manager in the context of solutions accelerator and solutions accelerators are a sophisticated way of implementing solutions, RPA solutions for your enterprise. And therefore, the orchestrator manager should also be kind of implemented in a sophisticated way. And we will show you how it has been set up in this environment and how, if possible, you could set it up that way so that you can use it as, um, as fluidly and as casually uh, or as efficiently as possible. So uh, coming back to the Project Explorer, um, like I said, without going into too much detail, there are a few th fundamentals that you have to understand about uh, the orchestrator manager. Once you get that, you can uh, go about using it. So I'm going to switch from the project explorer to the file explorer of this project structure because we need to see a few things that are not visible here. And before Andy, you go in a, uh, in a deep dive mode, uh, yep. rightly said what you mentioned before that this orchestrator manager, no matter which solution accelerator you may be implementing, this has been referred and mentioned in each of them because right. this is kind of a cornerstone solution. This is kind of considered to be part and parcel of your uh, dev test release cycle, right? right? Not right. necessarily when you're uh, migrating from one uh, account to another account, but also you can include this as part of your release cycle if you're moving yeah. uh, your automation from dev to test environment, from test to prod environment, Absolutely. or if you have any other environments in between. Yeah. So this is yeah. kind of... Uh, uh, a very key solution uh, to understand uh, and it can help. It can really help and speed up your whole deployment process, right? So it's, it's part right. of your DevOps life cycle, if you will. So right. with that with that context, I would say this is, uh, this is going to be an awesome walkthrough. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, so I am um, here in the file explorer of Orchestrator Manager. And um, if you observe, the first thing that you must be familiar uh, is to get familiar with is the configuration file. And usually when you download the package, you will have just one file and it will be named config.xlsx. But given the way we have set it up here, uh, I have two configuration files. I'll come to the detail later. But for all, uh, uh, you know, for the purpose of the initial orientation, uh, please note that it has got just one uh, configuration um, file. And in order to configure the file, uh, uh, you will have to first know uh, which orchestrator you're going to be connecting to and how are you going to connect to the orchestrator. That is the first step. Because if because the whole premise of orchestrator manager is, well, to manage the entities in the orchestrator, right? So, so that's the first thing. The second thing uh, is to understand about orchestrator entities. Now, these must not be mistaken to be data service entities. Uh, these are entities that are part of your orchestrator installation that will facilitate your automations to run. Some of the examples are assets, queues, uh, packages, uh, so on and so forth, right? So uh, if we look into, the, um, uh, into this project and go into the workbooks folder, you will see that there are many number of uh, Excel workbooks. And each workbook uh, kind of corresponds to an orchestrator entity. And based on which orchestrator entity you want to work with, uh, the orchestrator manager will present you that Excel automatically, right? So you really don't have to worry about uh, the, the nitty gritty details. The orchestrator manager takes care of it for you, right? So. Once we uh, get connected and once we start the orchestrator manager, you will see where all of these Excel workbooks come into play and what can we do with those Excel workbooks, right? Now, just to, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of get into a minor detail of uh, this Excel, if I open one of them, All right, there it is. 
Yep. So I think it's still uh, the tabs are still forming, but yeah. So there it is. Uh, so uh, what uh, you know the structure of the the uh, entity workbooks are pretty common, and um, you have to realize that there are there is a color coding. Uh, usually, the one where the color coding is all gray is basically a read-only area, meaning, and if you connect to an orchestrator all the detail you want to acquire from that orchestrator will be written in. This is inputs. So you're getting that information from, from the source orchestrator. And usually, if you want to take transfer these uh, entities, here you can see a list of assets. If you want to transfer them to a target uh, orchestrator, then you will have to take the specifics, a part of, uh, you know, the part of uh, this data that's been returned by the source orchestrator, and you'll have to put it into a different tab. Now, there are different uh, various tabs based on what kind of operations that you want to perform. Uh, for example, if you want to create new assets in this case, you put that information into the Create tab. If you want to um, edit an existing um, asset, then you put stuff in the Edit tab. If you want, And similarly, if you want to uh, do something uh, with the uh, with a, to delete an asset, you put it in the delete tab, so on and so forth, right? And one common thing that uh, you will have to note when you are performing any of the create, edit, or delete operations is that the orchestrator manager will write the status to the uh, to a status column here um, alongside each record, right? And here you can see that it's written an ID and a result. So if you run the same thing again, any record that has a status will be skipped. So when you want to rerun something, make sure that you have to delete or clear out the, the columns here so that those records are again consumed and reprocessed, right? So these are the few basic things you have to understand about how uh, an entity workbook uh, works in the, in the orchestrator manager. And this is pretty much common for all um, entities. What is different is probably the attributes of an entity because obviously um, assets have got different attributes when it comes to queues and yeah, packages have different. got different attributes when it comes to uh, when I mean, compared to uh, you know uh, to assets or queues. So I'm going to close out uh, this uh, workbook because orchestrator manager will take charge of doing it for us. It will open up uh, uh, you know the work uh, workbooks for us. The next thing we'll have to focus on is to configure our uh, our config file. So for that, you will need to know how to connect from, um, from Orchestrator Manager to your Orchestrator instance. So here I have my source orchestrator. I consider this source because I do all of my development work here. You might have seen this before in many of the videos on RPA Vanguard channel. So I need to figure out how to connect to this uh, to this instance. Now there are a couple of ways to do it. One is to use OAuth, which is the recommended approach. But for connecting as OAuth, you will have to register your orchestrator manager as a confidential application, and uh, you'll have to have a client key and a client secret. Now that is a bit more involved. But as we're demonstrating this for most audience, we'll go the other way, which is the orchestrator API route. And the number of steps required to acquire it are much less. So if we are going that way, then what we have to do is go to admin and then once we get to the admin page, We go to the tenant. So remember, you are targeting a tenant. So if you have multiple tenants, you've got to be clear on which tenant you are actually picking up this information from or putting information into. You go into services, and then you come into the orchestrator uh, card here, this the style, and you click here. And when you click on API access, uh, you will see a dialog box that looks like this. And this gives you four attributes. Uh, your user key, your organization ID is actually your automation org. And then your tenant is basically a tenant in that org and then a client ID. 
So please note that I blanked these out because these, these need to be kept securely and not exposed uh, in any way. Because if you do, then you risk someone accessing your orchestrator uh, you know, information over API calls. So once you've taken a note of these, you are ready to actually configure your con uh, config.xlx uh, file. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch screens and I'm going to open up the config file. Now, in this case, I already told you that I've identified this orchestrator instance tenant as source orchestrator. So I have created two different config files because I don't want to keep writing, um, overwriting entries uh, on, on the configuration file. So in my case, I've created two of them and one config file is called config underscore source. So I'm going to open that up. And this is where uh, the, the default orchestrator manager differs. Yeah. Right? They only have one yeah. single configuration file, but Correct. it's completely up to us just to make your life simple. You Correct. can just copy the same file, rename it, have a different file so that you don't have to go back and forth. Right. And I really don't want to, you see, once you start getting into the configuration, you will understand why you might want to have a different file um, and, and not overwrite. And then if you overwrite on the same file, remember you run the risk of connecting to a wrong tenant. Exactly. Everything, and, and is, everything's yeah. <laughs> right. The, and you don't every know every file is known as up. every file is known as config. And you have, you exactly. forgot what tenant you configured to, and you may end up writing something or deleting something from the wrong tenant. So Absolutely. please be very careful. Have one config file separate, have it in source control so that it's tightly controlled and it's not misused or used incorrectly unintentionally, right? Mistakes happen. Exactly. Right? You're going to use this as part of your DevOps life cycle, right? You, you right. would essentially have uh, individual config file for each environment. So right. you may end up having multiple files of this. Right, exactly, yeah. right. So if you look at the first entry here, I'm in the settings tab. The first entry is the path to your entity workbooks, right? I had talked about the entity workbooks, the set of all Excel workbooks. You got to tell orchestrator manager where that is set up. And remember, when you are moving data or entity data from source to target, uh, the orchestrator manager will read the same location. It will read the same Excel. So it will read the Excel once when it gets the information from the source. Then once you set up all the deployment details to the target, it will read the same Excel to move those entries to the target orchestrator. So this is a common path to your workbook, um, to your workbooks. Uh, and that's what I have put in here. The next would be your cloud tenant name, right? This is the tenant name under your org, right? You might have multiple tenants. So again, uh, the right tenant that you gathered from your API access uh, uh, dialog box that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. And this is, of course, your your orchestrator, uh, your automation cloud instance name, which is your org, right? Yeah. So you put in these, you can skip anything that says on-premise unless you have an on-premise installation, in which case those entries are going to be different. We will talk about other specific entries that we need to focus on maybe in the next episode. But here we are going to give you just the basic uh, setups that you need to make to get this working and off the ground. So on the setting sheet, this is all you need to configure, right? And then the advanced settings will have uh, many other settings that you can go uh, into and alter or what you call modify based on your comfort level once you get you know used to how to work with orchestrator manager safely otherwise most of the stuff here is templatized it is standard you really don't have to touch anything uh, the biggest uh, um, you know variation or exception to the rule is if you are using oauth a method of uh, connecting to the orchestrator then uh, these will come into play otherwise if you are using api access um, you're not going to be using these uh, you will actually be, uh, there's a different mechanism for that. But otherwise, uh, if you look at all these settings, we can talk about it in the next session. Here below, uh, 
uh, on line 26 and 27. Um, uh, orchestrator manager has the ability to take your credentials that you entered the first time. That is basically your orchestrator API credentials. And when you select the option, it can save your credentials to your credentials manager automatically. So that the next time when you connect, you really don't have to put in your keys each time, right? So that's an added benefit. So I would recommend using that so that you don't have to, you know, copy paste those keys every time. And all that will make sense to you once I get the automation uh, orchestrator manager running. So with that, uh, what I will be doing is I will not be running the orchestrator manager from the studio project. I will be running it uh, from my UiPath assistant. That is because, like I said, uh, it is absolutely the easy way out for you to run something from UiPath Studio. But when you are performing or implementing projects to the sophistication level of using solution accelerators, I think that uh, it is better to use the orchestrator manager as an attended automation, as a commoditized tool uh, so that your migrations and your management, orchestrator management becomes that much more fluid and efficient, right? So with that, I'm going to close this file out and I'm going to switch to UiPath Assistant. So I will And I have deployed this automation already as an attended automation here. You can see that I've named it Orchestrator Manager Unified. Uh, the reason I've named it so is because I'm going to be using it to manage multiple orchestrators. So I, it has the capability to connect to different orchestrators and I can, I can show you how I'm going to do that. So the first thing that I do is I know where I must connect, right, to get my information. So I will take the orchestrator manager unified uh, you know automation click on its name and then i'm going to modify the configuration file that i will need to connect to the source right and here is the full path to the configuration file and if i go to the end you see it is wired to connect to the source orchestrator right so i'm good there so now that I know that I'm good to uh, go, I'm going to run the automation. And this is the only input required primarily. If yeah, primarily, you set up yes. that input, then you are yeah. ready to kick off your automation. Uh, there is another one. Uh, I think there is Japanese version of it too. So if you change the language, uh, but I did not change that because like once I change, I won't be able to follow, <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, what it says. Uh, but there is English and Japanese and you can find that in your uh, folder structure. So now it's starting up. Remember that it's an attended automation with uh, UiPath forms and uh, you will see the form showing up. Okay, I'll trim it down during editing. No, it does take time. Yeah. Um, it does take time. Um, the reason you see the delay in the startup is because I have started it in the past and I have I have given it the option to save the credentials in the credentials manager. So what it is probably doing is before it starts up, it is retrieving my credentials and populating all the fields, right? So this is the uh, uh, this is the UI, the opening UI of Orchestrator Manager. And here you will see that by default, the OAuth method of connection is enabled. So if you're using API access, please disable this before you hit OK, because if you don't, it is going to fail, right? So I'm going to disable the OAuth and you see that it changes the inputs that are required. So once again, if I click OAuth, it needs a different set of credentials. When I disable OAuth, it requires your orchestrator user key and your client ID, right? So for the first time, you took it from the dialog box, the API dialog box I showed you in the a, a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You're going to enter that here. And if I bring it up side by side,
you will see that this is the user key that you're going to enter. And this will be your client ID that you're going to enter in the second dialog box. So those are the entries that you're going to enter for the first time. And once you have done that, you can enable this option and say, save credential in Windows Credential Manager. So when you do that for the first time, when orchestrator, uh, when orchestrator manager connects to your source orchestrator, it's also going to create a credential in your credentials manager. You can go into the credentials manager and you will see a credential has been created for this tenant, right? Uh, so my tenant is RPA Vanguard support service. You will see that a credential has been created. Now I'm going to connect by clicking the OK button. So I have everything populated. And you can see that the last three values are coming from your Excel config, right? You entered these, th these three entries in your Excel config. So they are coming from here. The only two that you need to enter at the beginning would be your user key and your client ID. And with that, I'm going to hit OK. And here is the entity management menu. And every item listed here is an orchestrator entity. And this, again, I'm saying it must not be confused with data service entity. They're completely different. These are entities that are specific to your orchestrator. They reside in the orchestrator and they help your automations run, right? These are all the resources, right? Primarily Correct. all the assets. Yeah, uh, actually, I don't know why they named it entity. They should... Uh... Uh, or I don't know, maybe they should have used a different terminology, but let I'm, I'm just keeping it official, <laughs> right? So let us say that now I want to get all the assets from, or all the queues from a certain, um, uh, from my source, from a certain folder, and I want to deploy those queues to my target, right? So what I'll do is, I'm going to choose Q. Watch what happens as I change the menu item. If I go to process, if I say Q, it changes again, right? It knows which, which workbook it has to go refer. Correct. Right? From so that's why I said to read all the elements. Input. Correct. And, and that's why I said that uh, it's not it's not worth it to get into the integrity details because yeah. it already does it for us right and what i want to do now is to get the information on the queues from my source orchestrator right so i'm going to say, choose the get operation there are so many other operations here but you will start most likely with the get operation and then i'm going to hit execute And you just saw what happened. I had some previous entries here. It cleared it out, mm -hmm. right? And opened the worksheet and it cleared it out. And now if you look at the name of the workbook, it is the queues workbook. So it has automatically opened it. And because you want to do a get operation, it has cleared the board for you. Now comes the stage where you're going to choose which folder you're going to deploy or what queues from which folder from source are you going to deploy to your target? So what I will be doing is I'm going to be selecting queues from the shared folder. I have a few queues from, from the shared folder and I'm going to hit okay. Now, most of the work will happen on the Excel and therefore you have to focus on the Excel once I hit the okay button. And there it is, it has completed the operation. It has got me the information from my source. Now imagine if you have a very complex project with hundreds of queues, 
Imagine how easy this would be. You go to your source and you fetch the information on all those hundred queues or the thousands of assets that you have or hundreds of credentials that you have. So within a by a click of a button, you got all the information you need. Now, uh, you'll have to take a look at what's produced here. Um, it has the IDs of the source. Of course, those IDs are unique to the source. You cannot use them, right? When you're going to the target, they will have different set of IDs. But what you can use are non-numeric readable pieces of information of uh, the, the queue. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two queues and I'm going to migrate them to my target orchestrator. And in the target orchestrator, my setup is a little different. In my target orchestrator, one of the queues will go into the shared folder and another queue will go into my actual modern folder, right? So I'm also trying to cover how to do a one-to-one -one mm -hmm. transfer and one to different one transfer, to yeah. right? Yeah. So now what we have to do is we have to transfer the information we see here from get into create. Now you can't simply copy paste everything and put it in there. That is because the schema of create is different from the schema of get. So you'll have to be careful when you do that. If you copy paste, you'll there is just confusion. So what I'll do is I will transfer them one column at a time. And then once you are familiar with it, you can have a better, a better method of transferring this uh, these entries. So first I'm going to copy uh, these entries and I'm going to go into create. And if you look at this, this is these are entries from my previous uh, attempt of testing. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy folder names to folder names. And then I'm going to take the queue name. So uh, here are the queue names. And of course the description is the same. So I'm just going to skip that step because that is not very important right now. Uh, but what's important is probably these attributes, right? You you want to make sure that uh, all the attributes of the what is set at source are also the same as set at target. So you go to create, of course, unique reference, and then auto retry, yes, and so on and so forth, right? So you transfer the entries column to column, but you can see that there are no IDs here because the source IDs cannot be used in the target, yeah. right? So please be careful now. I'm going to delete these, like I said at the beginning of this presentation. If you have anything in the result, those records will be skipped if you want to run them again. So I'm going to hit delete, right? Now comes the point where I want to tr move my queue to a different folder. So if I go to my target uh, orchestrator, uh, what you see here in the light theme is my target orchestrator. I have a folder called my business folder and you see it has no queues. It has zero queues. And if I go to shared, it has zero queues as well. So I'll be taking one queue, putting it into my business folder. And then I'll be taking another queue and putting it into the shared folder, right? So now I know what my target uh, folders are. I'm going to come back to my worksheet and I'm going to change this to my So I will be transferring T Watcher 2022 to my business folder, but T Watcher 2022 ops will be in the shared folder, right? So now I know what I'll be where I'll be deploying it to. Now it's time for me to save this worksheet, close it, and connect to my target orchestrator. So I'm going to save this and I'm going to close this Excel. It is a good practice to do it. Please don't exit the automation without closing. Otherwise you will have that, uh, you know, unpleasant uh, thing showing up in Excel open saying whether you want to review that file. So you really don't want to do that. And now I am going to cancel out of orchestrator manager and I will shut down orchestrator manager because I need to now reestablish a new connection, right? So I'm going to say cancel. 
and orchestrator manager has stopped. And here is how we have set this up. I again click this uh, uh, this automation and I go in and I change this to target. Yeah, and I, I say think, save. I think mostly this this particular use case what uh, when we have to migrate like if you have a big uh, COE, large COE, where you have uh, like 50 users or even 100 yeah. users, right? Just yeah. moving those credentials is, is a pain, <laughs> right? But with this particular like this, every yeah. every infrastructure team has to come up with some kind of scripting, right? So this is kind of yeah. that already built in. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great, right? I mean, I mean, they have looked at this and say, okay, we need to give our people something um, very few, uh, you know, software vendors do that, right? They they leave us to figure all these things out through APIs and things like that, right? Yeah. Okay. And it does work so, behind the scene. All the APIs are there. That's, yeah. that's how each of those Excel sheet where we are seeing those get create yeah. those separate tabs, though, those are actually calling those in specific API. That's kind right. of a mapping that they have inside the code. Correct. So now, uh, folks, what I'm going to do is start my my orchestrator manager. This time, you will see it connecting to this instance, and the name of this instance is RPA uh, Vanguard. So I'm going to click Run, and you'll pretty much see the same thing happening, but now the connection is different. And here is the uh, orchestrator manager again, and this time it has it is, uh, you know, um, targeting the target orchestrator. And remember, I have a second config file, and I've configured it similarly. But notice that the workbook path is the same for both of them. Remember, you set up a worksheet at the beginning from the source orchestrator. Now the orchestrator manager has to read the same worksheet in order to read the get tab and I mean the set tab or the create tab and move those entries up to your target orchestrator, right? And now once again, I'm going to disable this option to use OAuth and I already have the orchestrator keys and I'm going to click OK. Again, we have the familiar entity management interface. Remember what I was doing? I was migrating queues. So I'm going to select queue, but this time I'm going to select the create operation. Remember, read is over. Now this is right. So I'm going to hit create and I'm going to hit execute. And here is the all too familiar um, Excel workbook that you saw in the previous step. And everything is set and ready to go, but I'm going to make a small change just to prove that this is working. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to change the name of the queues a little bit, right? I'm going to go in here and say demo and demo. Right, so that we know for sure that when I execute the create operation that these queues start with the name demo, that will prove that whatever I put in here has actually been successfully migrated, right? So I'm going to again remove the success results here and save the Excel. Everything looks good. And I'm ready to execute the create operation. And please note, again, keep an eye on the status of uh, this, this Excel uh, workbook here, the ID and the result. 
I'm going to hit execute. Moment of truth. Yeah. Fingers crossed. We know how demo goes, right? And there it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Something is but, coming. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> One done. Two done. Yay. Right? Hey, good job. Right. All right. Well done. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I, I was nervous about this because sometimes you don't know, you know, what mistake you might have made. So now, uh, please note, I'm going to show you one more demo. So in all good sense, I'm going to copy the IDs of this queue of these two queues. Remember, they are now IDs from the target, right? And you will need them uh, because if you want to do other operations, you will need IDs apart from the names. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these two IDs and the ID for uh, the first ID is for my business folder and the second ID is for the shared folder, right? So I'm going to copy these and I'm going to put it in notepad. I'm going to come back to these later. But first, we want to go and see if our operation has really materialized in the target orchestrator. So I go to target. And here you can see that my business folder has got queues, shared has got queues, and if I click in here, you can see demo T Watcher 2022 has been migrated. And I said that I'm going to get a bit cheeky and make a small change. And if I go to my business folder, and look at queues, you see demo and the queue name has been migrated, right? So this proves how you can take, you either do a one-to-one -one migration or you can do a one-to-many or one-to-different migration. You see the queues have ended up in two different places. And now uh, what I want to be doing is I want to link a queue from the shared folder into uh, into this my business folder. I want my business folder to have a queue that is linked, right? So here you can see there are no linked queues. And uh, what I want to do is if I go into the shared folder and go into queues, you see that I want to take the T Watcher 2022 ops queue and I want to link it into my business folder, right? If I go in here, I want to link the ops queue into this queue, right? So how do we do that? Now, this is a case for, for an update, right? A linking. Uh, this, is a, this is a case for linking. So how do I do that? Now, remember, this is not a get operation. This is still an update operation, right? A linking is still an update operation. And now you are linking, doing the linking in the target orchestrator. Therefore, you don't have to connect back to the source orchestrator, right? Your connections are good. And now how do I go about doing that, right? So what I will do is there is a tab here called link or unlink. I'm going to click on that tab. And this is an option that will allow you to link queues or unlink queues, right? So I click in here. Again, as usual, I'm going to delete uh, the, the, the results of the previous operation. And I want to link a queue from shared into business folder. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I have to be careful now. I have to pick out the right ID of the queue from the shared folder, right? So going back to Notepad, the second queue was for the shared folder, right? So I'm going to take that queue ID and I'm going to delete this and I'm going to put in this here. And I'm telling the orchestrator manager, look, there is a queue with ID 856184 in my shared folder. I want you to link it into my business folder, right? And how does it know how to link? I select the option to link. There is a drop down here and one more very convenient feature. Most of the options are drop downs. So you don't have to remember what to, uh, what to, what value to put in there. If you use the drop down, 
you can select the option you need. Now I'm ready to link the two queues. So I'm going to save this uh, this uh, worksheet and I'm going to erase, already I've erased the result. So there's nothing for me to do. I'm going to keep this open because there's no need to close it and open it again. I'll go back to the queue, but this time I'm going to use or select the linking operation, right? So I choose the link or unlink and I'm going to hit execute. There it is. You see the operation has resulted in success and orchestrator manager has launched uh, itself back into the foreground. I'm going to I'm going to keep that aside. Now let us go back into the target and Look see the target, if the linking yeah. operation has materialized. So I go into target and this time I refresh my business folder. Remember there were two, two queues at that time. There were no linked queues. There it is. You see a third queue has dropped in and that queue is linked from the shared folder. So demo T Watcher 2022 ops is actually in the shared folder. Perfect, awesome. Right, and it has been linked back to this folder here, right? So you see, we have demonstrated how to create something and also perform an additional operation, right? And now uh, the other thing that you might want to see is how to delete uh, these queues and reverse everything that you've done, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to switch back. Remember, all these operations are happening in the target now, and I'm playing around to demonstrate how many things we can achieve uh, through Orchestrator Manager. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to open my Excel worksheet here again. Now I'm going to unlink the queue. Before I delete, I have to unlink the queue. Remember, you might run into problems if you're trying to delete something from a source folder if that queue is linked to another folder. So you may have to reverse your operation. And now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go in here and say unlink. And I'm going to erase the result. I'm going to save. Come back to Orchestrator Manager. The operation is link or unlink. I'm going to execute. Success once again, quickly going back into the uh, target orchestrator. If I go into my business folder, refresh, the linked queue is gone. And now comes the action of deleting, right? Now I want to delete these two demo queues because they're not part of this uh, the, the production. So I'm going to delete them. So this time, I have to focus on the delete tab in my workbook, right? Now here, you have to be very, very careful. In this case, you not only need the queue ID, you also need the folder ID. Now the question comes, why? The, the reason is you might have the same queue or the queue named identically in two different folders. It is possible. Yes, very much possible. So if you focus only on the queue name and not the ID, you may end up deleting the wrong queue. Right? And therefore, you require the folder ID, the folder name, the queue ID, and the queue names. So you see the references are absolute and accurate. That way, you do not make a mistake. And if you specify the wrong ID, the operation is going to fail. That way, you're protected from accidentally deleting your queues, right? Is, yeah, is that a uh, is there a validation uh, in the orchestrator manager? If in case if you don't yeah. provide a folder ID, it says okay. folder ID is required, okay. and I, I'll demonstrate that we can we can try to look at. It's a good point you bring up. So uh, this is what I'm going to do. Remember those two IDs that I have uh, I had copied. Mm -hmm. So uh, one was from the shared folder, and one was from the uh, uh, from the my business folder. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to add them here. Now I have to be careful about what the name of the queues were 
in the business folder. So I'm going to go back to my create and the name of the queue in the my business folder is demo watcher 2022 and the name of the queue in the shared is demo watcher 2022 ops so i'm going to come to delete and i'm going to put them here of course i'm going to wipe out the results here now watch what happens if i do not specify the folder ids and i'll also tell you how to get these folder ids Right, an easy way of doing it. There are other ways, but I'll show you how to do that. So now I'm going to delete the folder IDs. I'm going to save. I'm going to come back to Orchestrator Manager. And this is the question that Pradeep just now posed. What, what's going to happen if I give it partial information? Now the operation this time is going to be delete. And I'm going to hit the execute button. Let's see what, what happens. And you see it, it failed at the first transaction. It said that folder ID is not valid. Remember, it doesn't stop there. It, it jumps to all the records and it gives you the status of each record. Now these are failed in 100% failure rate, right? This is very good because it safeguards you from deleting queues from a from a different folder. And it is very, very important that you have absolute reference. Okay, so what do I do? How do I get the folder IDs? There's an easy way out. You go to your orchestrator, you click on my business folder. And when you click on my business folder, you will see the URL here. There is an attribute called FID or folder ID, right? You grab that. And in this case, it is 858031. So I already have that ID. So I'm going to take that ID and I'm going to put it in here. And then, of course, the other one is shared, but I want to be absolutely sure. So I'm going to go back to the orchestrator. I'm going to click on shared. And I'm going to look at the folder ID. It is 858008. And I have that here already. So copy, go back and paste that in here. Now I have all the IDs I need, everything I need. Again, do not forget to wipe out the results of the previous operation. Save your Excel, return to Orchestrator Manager and hit Execute. Success. And now you see when you give all the details and give absolute references to the asset or the entity you want to delete, you are provided that is accurate, it will be deleted. Otherwise, it won't be. So going back, if I go into shared and go into queues, the queue name demo is gone. If I go into my business folder, likewise, and go into queues, the queue name demo is gone, right? So what I've demonstrated to you is how do you fetch the uh, information from the source orchestrator? And then once you have that information, disconnect from the source orchestrator, transfer your uh, asset uh, or your entity information into the create or the whatever operation you're making, transfer it into the create operation tab, for example. Then relaunch your orchestrator manager by connecting to the target orchestrator. Perform your create operation and then perform a linking operation, which is a modification after the fact that, that, that you've created the, uh, the queues. And then you reverse all your modifications and finally delete uh, the entities that you've created in the target orchestrator. So I hope that uh, you kind of got the gist of how orchestrator manager uh, works. I think uh, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it ran yeah. without a hitch. We must be grateful, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm very happy that the, the demos ran without, otherwise it's easy to make mistakes with all the IDs, yeah. the names and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that it went well.
So one last thing that I want to bring up is uh, the uh, my uh, recommended solution of uh, how to use the orchestrator manager. You have seen that I have not run the orchestrator manager from studio. It's a it's a very crude way of doing it because the orchestrator manager is already commoditized for us to use. So for us to really run it from studio offers no specific advantage, right? You are it is a it is a commodity and it is making you do your job faster. And therefore, it is better that you deploy it to the orchestrator and use it as a commodity. So I am going to bring up a, a diagram of how I have set this up. And I'm just going to walk you through really quickly so that you know if you think that this is worth exploring, you can have similar implementation on your end. So here is the diagram of what I just ran, right? Uh, on the top here, you see very important that both the uh, the uh, uh, you know the the orchestrator manager refers to a common location for your configuration files, and I have kept the configuration files outside of the automation. So basically, what happens is when your automation is packaged, the config file is not packaged in the data folder the configuration file is saved externally so that I can change my configuration files the way I want. And you saw how I did that, right? I changed from source to target. And if I want to change back to source, I can do that again. So therefore, the configuration files have been completely externalized. That's major change number one. And the workbook path is common to both the, uh, the configuration of the uh, target orchestrator as well as the source orchestrator. And you saw that was the first line in the configuration file. And both of the configuration files point to the common workbook path, right? And then when you saw how I ran this, when I started the orchestrator manager, I put in the credentials of the source orchestrator. I switched to the config uh, source and when it ran, it placed a request using the using the information from the source configuration. It connected to the source orchestrator and it got me the information that I need into my common workbook, right? It got it to my common workbook. And then in the second half of the process, I manipulated that workbook because I wanted to now create the queues in the target. And then I changed my configuration setting in the orchestrator manager to target. And then I restarted Orchestrator Manager. And this time, it used the credentials that I set for the target and then connected to the target orchestrator and performed the operations that I needed to perform. Basically, create, edit, or delete operations that I just showcased, some of them which I showcased now, and effected or materialized those operations in the target orchestrator, right? So basically what I've done is I can say, I have made a mini solutions accelerator within a solutions accelerator, if I might say, because I have tried to make the usage of orchestrator manager much more faster than simply taking the same file configuration file, overwriting your entries every time, making mistakes and God forbid, connecting to the wrong orchestrator and trying to delete something you're not supposed to delete. Right. Yeah. And therefore, all, you're always running a risk. Yes. A it's, risk. it's always a risk, especially when you're doing this under tight deadlines, right? Tight deadlines, um, you know, uh, doing it at night times, you, you know, when you're half asleep, <laughs> you know, it's dangerous. So don't take the that's risk, when most, guys. That's I don't when, want to. That's when most of the migration happen in any way. <laughs> exactly. Right. At night. And, and it's, that's exactly what I don't want to do. Right. Uh, you might be doing it at the wrong time. Accidents happen, errors happen, but what we can do as solution architects, lead developers, technical managers, is that we can try to minimize those errors. Remember, humans commit the most errors in most cases, and therefore we have to try to minimize those to the best of our capabilities, right? And again, I recommend have a different source file for each of your tenants, have them source controlled, so that you know anybody who's pulling them out and making changes to them, it's tracked and they're not going in and simply 
try moving things between orchestrator and instances or deleting things from the orchestrator, right? So I think we have covered a lot in this video, Pradeep. Uh, if you have oh, any yeah, questions, absolutely. I'm open and, um, you know, if one not... of the yeah, one of the questions I do have is this yeah. this is really thorough uh, and really kudos to you, Andy. You took this and you you gave a in depth demo. I I don't think so. Any anyone could have done better on this for sure. Uh, one question that I did do have uh, when I have already provided uh, the inputs uh, to the Excel, yeah, uh, the assets. Uh, the individual workbooks, right? Yeah. I see those workbooks do open up. Yeah. That's something by design or we can turn it off because let's say if you have a, a big migration going on, right? Then yeah. I, I it, some, it, it, some it, folks it, may not may not be interested to look at it. They may want to look at it only when it is all done. Yes, but uh, the the fact of the matter is uh, the the way the orchestra the orchestra manager is set up is you do the read, right, and then you are expected to transfer the information from the get tab to the create tab or the delete tab or the update tab, right, or or, or the uh, you know any one of the tabs where you want to perform that operation, right, right? and your workflow it might be possible. To set that up but it might require you to uh, do some extensive modification to change that workflow right and yeah. um, that I'm will mean more in, I, i'm thinking more in terms like when the get is done right you may get a, a kind of notification on that attended form itself that get yeah. operation completed yeah so then then i can go and open it up similarly when the when uh when my target process is done right when the migration yeah. is complete then yeah. also it can show me a notification. So that may be something that's kind of a second version or extension to it. I think it is possible, right? Yeah. All you have to do is make sure that you run Excel in invisible mode and right. uh, and then uh, have a notification out. I mean, it's possible, but again, uh, it all depends on how much time you're going to give to uh, you know modify this because this is a pretty heavy uh, um, uh, project. And if you go into each of these for example, let's go into each of these, uh, uh, you know, code files. And if you look at any one of the entities and stuff like that, uh, you see it is doing many number of operations, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, no, I understand that. Yeah. Primarily, I was just thinking just how, what what could be the next upgrade to this, right? But this yeah. is definitely an awesome, uh, in a way, it's a complete, yeah. pro a complete solution, right? Even though yeah. we said that solution ac accelerators are more of a reference solution, they are yeah. not a final solution, yeah. but uh, I think orchestrator manager is an exception out of it because this definitely does provide end-to-end -end service. Yeah, uh, what you what you want to do with that? It, so I I think it's a good question for the community as well, right? I mean, what yeah. would they do to make this better, right? I mean, um, the uh, you know, in fact, if you take the core uh, usage, uh, the simplest usage will show you. I won't even show you how this has been set up, the way we have set it up, right? It will simply say, okay, use the same config file, uh, use the, and, uh, you know, update from source to target and target and back and then run the automation. In fact, the documentation says you can run it directly from studio. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, it all depends on, um, I don't know, maybe uh, with, will, will this work with apps? Like kind of thing, you know, uh, can we kind of put apps, data service and everything together and uh, somehow make that possible? I think um, it's right uh, now, it's just the orchestrator manager. That yeah. may be a data service manager or apps manager, something yeah. like, something on those lines, right? Yeah, I, I don't know, uh, but, uh, but this is pretty good to know. Yeah. Um, uh, because maybe next week uh, when we have time, uh, when we discuss the advanced settings, uh, we can show them some of the things we did with packages and how, uh, you know, we could use that information to not just do migrations, but also have, uh, you know, a good repository of how we can maintain our packages and things like that. Right. No, absolutely. Um, I think yeah. that, um, that would be, that would be further, uh, further into the solution. So I yep. think, uh, I think th this is good, Andy. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I think um, we have a lot to digest from this, yeah. uh, for sure. And yeah. I would love to see what what the community is thinking and what 
uh, what additional features they would want to add to it. Means this this kind of opens uh, opens a Pandora box of ideas, Correct. right? What else Correct. you can make? Uh, because yeah. if if you're building solution day in day out, you would definitely have those uh, those operation operational challenges, right? Yep, um, absolutely. You you do have to think about that aspects as well to make your life easy and make it uh, as less error prone as as you can um so, you know an interesting part is i want to like uh, run a demo of getting the credentials uh, pradeep getting and setting credentials because passwords are involved and mm -hmm. i think that uh, the community will find a tremendous use for that i'm working on that demo hopefully i'll have that uh, next week okay. uh, but uh, but we have enough to discuss about the other aspects of orchestrator manager and and uh, I will try to like cover that uh, you know credentials part uh, next week, and um, hopefully it'll happen. Otherwise, we can have a third part or something like that. But uh, I'm I'm thinking we have covered a lot of ground today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that being said, uh, it's a wrap for today's session. Thank you again, Andy, for putting a lot of effort on this and explaining it in 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 a very thorough way. I really enjoyed yeah. this conversation and also getting understanding the nitty gritties of it yeah but uh, uh, thank you Pradeep because you actually started this with the solution accelerator and then when we covered orchestrator manager I'm like wait a second what's that right it caught my attention and I wanted to go after it and and sure enough we got this far and I'm hoping that whoever is using orchestrator uh, manager as part of solutions accelerator will find our discussion very useful absolutely yeah. all right so Thank you again, and please like, subscribe, and share your comments and thoughts. Uh, what do you think about the series, uh, and what additional ac solution accelerator that you may be interested in? Because uh, there are a ton of them. Uh, we definitely want to do a few more. Uh, that that gives us an opportunity to explore more into right. the realm of solution accelerators, and also bring some really valuable content out for the community. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.